How's, it, how's everyone doing? Good? Hey, it's a nice chilly morning. Uh, it's been chilly all week. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. It feels good to be here on a Sunday morning to see all your faces and just to be able to worship together and to engage in some good dialogue about faith and what it means to connect with God. If you're new around here, uh, Access, our mission statement is to, we are a church seeking to live life with God in the depth of our soul, uh, in relationship, in community with one another, and on mission with God, to join him in his redemptive purposes around the world. And so we are, we take that seriously and we really believe uh, that that's important. And if you're new around here, uh, we invite you to explore what that means with us and, and to dive deeper in with us as well. If you haven't been with us, uh, we just started this year focusing on the topic of hope. And so hope is our annual theme, and this month of February, we're looking at how we might kind of diversify our language around hope by talking about hope in more kind of reasonable, rational type languages, language. Um, Our series is Mind Your Faith, Mind Your Faith. And so the reason why we kind of dove into this topic at the beginning of the year is because last, um, back in 2018... I got in several conversations with people who wanted to go deeper with God, but found it difficult because of different doubts or different reasons that they had bothering them in their minds about who God might be or how they might, uh, or what Christianity was or what it meant to be in a relationship with God. And so uh, part of the engagement that God has with us is he invites us to, to love him with all of who we are our heart, soul, and our mind. And sometimes the story that's out there is that in order to really believe, you kind of have to set aside your thoughts, set aside your rational side. And that's not the case at all. That's not the way that God engages us. Our faith is not a blind faith. I know that's a term that's thrown around a lot uh, in different circles, and it's used in popular culture to talk about how people... Uh, of the Christian faith might engage with their God, but uh, blind faith is not what we have. God actually has and gives, has given us reasons to believe. Um, historically, uh, this has also been a divide that has happened between uh, different worlds, uh, the scientific community, uh, some of the academic community, and the church community. And because these uh, different worlds got separated a couple hundred years ago. There are social and historical reasons why we often tend to see faith and reason as very two distinct different ways to know the world. But let me assure you, um, God engages our whole being, and he doesn't want you to simply believe in something you don't know. He wants to be a God who engages all of us in all of our thinking, in all of our reasoning, in all our rationality. So today, we're going to be talking about faith and science. So it's mind your faith and your science. Um, And we're going to start today by looking at a passage of scripture. um, And then we're going to be talking about how this divide between faith and science uh, evolved over time. And then we're going to talk about some ways that we can reimagine a better relationship. How can we move forward in this life together? How might faith and science strike a new path together? So as we enter into this scripture today, let me just lead us in a word of prayer. Invite God to lead our thoughts in our time together. Let's pray together. Dear God, we just come before you this morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you for leading us. Thank you for inviting us into this deeper relationship that we can have through Jesus. And as we consider your word this morning, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would just move here. That we, as listeners, as we attend to your scripture and to your words, would just remove, uh, you would just remove any obstacles to our faith. Any obstacles that are hanging us up this morning. And I pray, Lord God, we are listening to you. Help us to follow you with our whole being. In Christ's name, amen. All right. So we're going to talk about this passage from Isaiah. And this is an interesting passage of scripture um, that comes in the Old Testament. And to give you a little bit of context, we first need to remember where 
things began in the Bible. Genesis 1 begins with God creating the universe and God creating human beings. The very beginning of Scripture tells us there's a difference between God and humanity. God is eternal. He's transcendent. He's beyond. God is God, and we are created human beings. There's a fundamental difference between who we are and who God is. We are not God. We, are, we don't know everything. We are not eternal in that sense. God is. And so in the book of Isaiah, God frames it this way for his people. And he reminds them who he is. And he says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And this distinction between God and humanity is so vital for how we're going to move forward in our message today. It's really important for us to understand this difference. This is our key text for understanding the basics of how faith and science are going to work together. We'll come back to it in different ways throughout today. But let me try and explain to you what this means in... in, um, a couple of other forms. So this is a quote from an author named Karen Armstrong uh, who wrote the book, The Case for God. In our democratic society, we think that the concept of God should be easy and that religion ought to be readily accessible to anybody. That book was really hard, readers have told me reproachfully, shaking their heads in faint reproof. Of course it was, I want to reply. It was about God. But many find this puzzling. And what she's pointing out here is that we do think that knowledge should be accessible by all. And yes, it kind of is. In in our democratic society, we want to believe that everyone can understand everything. But is that really the case when it comes to God? God, if we take that Isaiah passage seriously and remember what Genesis says about this difference, when we talk about God, there should be a healthy level of respect because we're We're trying to connect with a being who is eternal. Um, Another way to put it. So years ago, um, my daughter, uh, Mia, uh, in her kindergarten class had a a class pet. Her name was Patches. She was a rabbit uh, with white fur and black patches. So that's the name. And one weekend, we had a chance to take Patches home for the weekend. So Patches came home to live in our household. Uh, And Patches was a pretty intelligent bunny. Um, Someone in the class had trained this bunny to be potty trained. So I find that pretty fascinating. I didn't know rabbits could do that. But this rabbit knew where to go to the bathroom and wouldn't, you know, poop all over your home. I mean, that was the idea. And really, she didn't. It was was pretty incredible. Um, And so the kids had fun all weekend long playing with Patches. Um, But Patches... There's a fundamental difference between human beings and rabbits. Um, as much as we tried, as much as we wanted to try, um, rabbits have intellectual uh, limits. They can't understand everything. And even if you tried, even if, even if we got the best math tutor for Patches, let's say, she would not be able to understand the Pythagorean theorem. It just doesn't work that way. It's impossible. Uh, language differences, conceptually, uh, is beyond the intellectual ability uh, of a rabbit to understand uh, higher level geometry. Now, um, why do I bring this up? Because this is exactly what Isaiah is talking about. When we say that God's thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are beyond our ways, we are understanding there's a fundamental difference between who God is and who we are as human beings. Now, Um, On to this topic for today. Why is there a conflict between science and faith? How did we get here? Uh, And to begin talking about this, um, I want to say, first of all, that there wasn't always this conflict. This conflict didn't always exist. Uh, In fact, uh, many church leaders and many scientific leaders back in the day were both one and the same. Uh, so when I was in seminary, I remember hearing about this guy. Uh, his, his name is John Wesley. He's a church leader, founder of the Methodist movement. 
um, that you may have heard of, uh, a brilliant man who led the church in many significant ways, but he gave some advice to young pastors. And I remember when I first heard this, I jot this down, I thought it was so interesting. He advised young ministers who were going into church ministry to learn four things. First of all, learn how to share your faith. Very important to be able to communicate that well to others. Learn how to pray. Learn how to pray. Can you get that? Learn how to read Greek and Hebrew. So it's basically reading the scriptures in their original, in their original languages. Now, all those three things... Um, or what most of us seminary students were engaged in, and that made a lot of sense. Uh, but this fourth one was kind of interesting. He also said, learn philosophy and learn geometry. And for him, it didn't really kind of stand out as unusual. This was just kind of like his advice to young ministers. And I really like this because his worldview, his understanding of knowledge was very integrated. Knowledge of God and knowledge of the natural world, it, it all made sense to study it all. It all kind of fit together. And it, there didn't need to be this divide. Now, last week in the message, we talked about how there was a divide that happened about 200 years ago when uh, two different intellectual movements started um, biblical criticism and uh, evolutionary bi biology. When those things came on the scene, segments of the church kind of retreated from that um, much of North American Christianity, uh, evangelical Christianity, took that kind of route and separated themselves from those conversations and really didn't get into them. They've, they are now, but back then, about 200 years ago, because they removed themselves from that conversation at large um, and decided that the faith was really meant to be lived more personally and more privately, this divide began to take place. Um, so there's more than just intellectual reasons why faith and science began to diverge. There were social reasons as well. Um, and here is where we are at today. So Time Magazine a few years ago came out with this issue saying God versus science, okay? So it's like, you know, they're going to sell magazines. So they want to make sure that this conflict is, is raised up to, to, you know, levels that would interest you. But, but there really is this conflict. And on one side of this debate... Um, is a guy named Richard Dawkins. He's an Oxford professor who's written a lot about evolutionary biology. He was, a, I think he's an evolutionary biologist. Um, and the way he writes about God and the way he writes about science is an either-or kind of dynamic. You have to choose one or the other. Now, he's kind of a brilliant guy. He's a good writer, and he's kind of entertaining. So a lot of people kind of subscribe to his view of things. It's an either-or decision. You either have to be a scientist and do that well, or you can go down the faith route, but you cannot do both at the same time. Now, um, he kind of represents a lot of atheists in their kind of view of the faith, but he's not alone. There's actually a number of Christian folks who subscribe to the either or side of things as well. So it's not just an atheistic kind of view. There are also Christian uh, thought leaders who also say, yeah, it's an either-or choice. You either go with science or you go with God. But this article also talked about a guy named Francis Collins. Francis Collins um, worked on the Human Genome Project, was also the, is the director of the National Institutes of Health, a uh, brilliant man. Um, and he was once an atheist and through life kind of came to know God and his worldview is very different. He says it's both and. It's science and faith. In fact, the more he gets into science, the more he studied the human genome, the more he learned about these things, he came to worship God. It led him into a deeper relationship with God. It's about science and faith. And this tradition or this perspective and this philosophy is really important to understand because it's kind of the stream that we swim in here at Access. It is the same as Wesley. It is the same as Francis Collins. Uh, other folks like the Pope have written to the Catholic Church saying that there is not a conflict with these things. Um, we here also believe in that side of things. Now, to kind of get deeper into this, this is a more nuanced point of view, and it requires a little bit more thinking to live in the kind of conjunction between these things. Um, to understand the conflict, 
It's also important for us to understand a number of words or definitions or what we're actually talking about. So science. I'm making an assumption here that we've been, as we've been talking about science, what exactly is science? Science is, it's a method for gaining knowledge of the natural and physical world. Science is a method for gaining knowledge of the natural and physical world. Now, we also use it in a couple different ways, but for today's conversation, this is a good enough definition. Uh, folks who are scientists use the scientific, remember, anybody remember studying the scientific method in like junior high? Okay, I know there are more scientists out there than <laughs> this is Access, and I know there are a lot of very scientific-minded folks here. Um, the whole thing behind the scientific method is you, know, right, you come up with a hypothesis to explain phenomena that you see in the world. You test it in observable, measurable ways. You share that with others, and then you kind of adjust your hypothesis uh, based upon whatever evidence you come out with. Okay, that's a very rough, rough way of describing the scientific method. But you kind of understand this. So on the popular level, if this is too theoretical, um, like a show that's on TV that, that kind of does, like, like when you look at like stuff like Law and Order or these you know, crime scene shows, there's a murder that happens, right? And when a murder happens, what happens next? There's usually a hypothesis. Who done it? You know, who did this terrible thing to this person? Uh, and then you're going to be looking for evidence for it. So uh, if you look for uh, a bullet or you look for you know, fingerprints, you're entering into the next term which is methodological naturalism. What's that? It's looking for natural causes to explain phenomena in the natural world. So you're going to look for explanations for what you see, the effects that you see, and you're going to look for them within the realm of the natural physical world around you. Good science requires you to do methodological naturalism. That's pretty basic. You're going to look for natural reasons to explain natural phenomena. Now, if you begin to verge off that path, like maybe vampires did it, or maybe, you know, you think it's Thor from Asgard or something, you have left methodological naturalism. You've entered into the Marvel universe and while that's very fun, that's, that's not the same as science and methodological. As much as they like to think that they're scientific, no, it's not. Um, all right, so a couple more terms here that are important for us to understand. Um, scientism. What is scientism? It is a philosophy that says that the only valid knowledge is knowledge gained through science. There's a philosophical position that says that the only sure thing that you know is knowledge that is based upon that scientific principle, that scientific method. If you follow that, you know things for sure. Other things, we don't know. Now, it's pretty easy for us to begin kind of tearing down scientism or begin looking at that as, actually, that's not a great philosophy. We actually know a lot of things. Um, even our so-called scientific knowledge is not always based on science. Like, how many of us here believe um, that we are composed of molecules and atoms and, you know, photons and electrons? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Most of us, I know, I'm not trying to trick you. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I mean, I believe that, you know, but, but why do I believe that? How, why do you believe that? Well, <laughs> in junior high, my science teacher told me that, and I believe it. Is it because I actually looked at an electron and a molecule and said, oh, yeah, that, that's what it is? Actually, no. Um, I saw a diagram in my science book. Um, it was a drawing, and I believed it. So most of our scientific knowledge, unless you're actually a scientist in the lab, some of you are, <laughs> so maybe that's different. But the majority of us here believe in these scientific ideas about the world because you were told it, right? We also know some other things about our world that are not based on science. For instance, again, I'm not trying to trick you. Um, how many of us believe here that racism is bad, is wrong, is actually evil? Right. Come on, you guys. <laughs> Please. Right, right. We can raise our hands. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a cold, dark morning, but... Um, 
yeah, I believe that's to be true. I believe that's true. I believe that's right. I believe it is wrong to be racist um, and, and for uh, racist practices to continue in, in culture, to be racially prejudiced. It's, it's wrong. But do I know that because of science? Do you know that because of science? Actually, no. Most of you know that because, because you were told it was right, right and wrong, uh, because of religious teaching, um, because of moral reasoning. Most of us are pretty sure it's wrong, but we didn't use the scientific method to get to that conclusion. You have moral knowledge, and that moral knowledge came from somewhere else. Now, scripturally speaking, we would say that came from the Spirit of God within you, um, and that has nudged our intuition, our moral intuition, into that area. Not everyone would say that's wrong. Anyway, anyway that's another topic for another, for the fall. Um, okay, last thing here um, is naturalism, um, and I would say ontological naturalism versus methodological naturalism. So this is a philosophy that says that there are only natural and physical causes for the events that we see in this world. There are only natural causes for the natural things that we see in this world. That is another philosophical position. In other words, all that exists is what you can see, taste, touch, feel, or hear. Um, it takes faith to believe in the last two things. These are faith positions based on philosophy. They are not the same as science. But what has happened and why this conflict continues to persist in our culture today is because many people conflate the ideas. They say that this is what science is and this is what naturalism is. And it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, and back to this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And what God is telling us is this. He is beyond us. And it, it makes sense for us to live humbly, intellectually humbly, when we come to this, for those of you who are followers of God, who follow Jesus, we should always have a healthy respect for who God is. He's not just, I know we like to have Jesus as our friend and <laughs> sing about those things, but we also remember that God is far above and far beyond who we are. He spoke the universe into being. I mean, I speak at home and nothing happens most of the time. You know, that's God. This is me. We, we know there's a difference. Um, for those of you who might be seeking after God, and maybe you're not in a place of faith yet, and you're trying to figure out if there are reasons enough to believe, I think it also makes sense to approach this with an intellectual humility. That just because you can't put God in a box, study, and come to a conclusion about it doesn't mean that everything is done. If God is truly God, by, con by definition, he exists beyond you. And it's not, it's not enough for you just to say that just because you don't see evidence right here, right here today, uh, that God doesn't exist for all time and eternity. Um, let me go on and explain how we might reimagine this kind of faith. Now, why is this important that we reimagine things? So I heard this talk in 2017 from uh, uh, a professor of evolutionary biology. Her name is Dr. April Maskowitz Cordero. I hope I said her uh, name right. Um, gave a really interesting talk um, about changing the narrative from an either-or to a both-and kind of conception of science. So in her first year of college, um, Dr. Cordero was in our evolutionary biology class, and her professor said, it's going to be either evolution or God. 
can't have both. It's an either or decision. And you're, you're going to have to make this decision. Um, this confused her greatly because she believed in God and wasn't sure what to do with that. So she went to a pastor, several pastors in fact, and asked the same question over and over. Is this true? Is it evolution or is it God? Do I, is this a, a true either or decision? And all the pastors said the same thing. Yes, it is. Um, And so as she journeyed through this and came up with more and more reasons to believe in evolutionary biology, she actually decided right then and there, during her freshman year, that she was going to be an atheist. She put her Bible aside and said, this is where the evidence points. I need to be true to my intellectual self and decided to go this way. So for the next several years of her life, she was an atheist. Fast forward in time after college, she said she... She had a bad breakup. She decided to spend a year in in Japan um, to kind of have an adventure and just kind of deal with life as best she could. Um, And she was told that there was no English books and entertainment, so she brought a couple of books with her, a couple boxes of books to Japan. She read read through the different boxes, and at the bottom of her second box, she said she found a Bible. She says she has no idea how it got there, Maybe her sister stuck it in there just to hope for things to get better with her faith life. But she started to read through the Bible, and she started a faith journey back to God. Now, what was interesting in all of this is that she began this journey of learning to meld these two together. Kind of like Francis Collins, kind of like John Wesley. And in her view... And this is what her life mission is. Uh, you can actually, you know, Google her name later and go to her website. It's definitely worth it to watch her videos. They're, they're great. Um, she's trying to weave these things together. And my point in, in sharing her story here is this. Many of us may be thinking about that for ourselves professionally. We may be thinking about that for our kids. It doesn't have to be an either-or dichotomy. It can be a both-and. We can do our best science even our best biology, our best evolutionary biology, and still be followers of Jesus. She's a living example of that. And I point back to this. To be a good scientist doesn't require you to be a subscriber of scientism or ontological naturalism. It just requires you to do good science, to follow the scientific method, to follow methodological naturalism, you know, So that is one way that I might reimagine this relationship. Some of you here are in an uncomfortable wrestling moment of where where your kids are going to be for this or where yourself, where you are going to be professionally. And I would say, love God with all your mind. Number two, science can add insight to our theology, some wonderful insight into our theology. So if you, you might not, this is a less popular picture of Albert Einstein. But back in about 1900, uh, this genius of a man began to have theories about how the universe worked. And some of his theories uh, understood that things like uh, space and energy and time were more elastic than we thought. They actually, in, they can change. And in order for him to come up with his, to continue down his theories, he needed to shift the way that he understood the universe. So up until that time, we believed we lived in a three-dimensional world, you know. Uh, You guys know what 3D is, you know. Um, He thought maybe there is a fourth dimension. The fourth dimension is time. And as he began to work out his theories and his equations, this made more and more sense. Now, back in the day, back in 1900, he didn't have these giant telescopes that could look way into the universe and see that it was expanding. He didn't have uh, particle accelerators where he could, you know, collide molecules and look at stuff. He he was, you know, theorizing about all this stuff. Um, And why why do I say this? Why do I talk about this? that diagram there on, that you're looking at is an explanation of dimensions, right? So the first dimension is like a line. Two dimensions is a plane. Three dimensions is a cube. That fourth dimension is that cube transported through time. Um, this could yield some really, I think, some really interesting theories about God and theology. 
So, um, I, I realize this is kind of heady. I hope we, <laughs> this isn't a turn off for some of you, but I, I, I think this is really kind of cool. So, that first plane there is a sphere passing through a plane over time. If you lived in the second dimension, what would you experience if you saw the sphere passing through your plane? Well, you would see a circle that would grow bigger and larger over time. And now you might be tempted to think that they're different objects, but it, it's actually the same object that's going through your world. The second picture uh, is a number of different spheres, large spheres and small spheres, all, that's like a, a tangent with the plane, they all intersect the plane at a point, right? People living in a two-dimensional world would have no idea how big or small that sphere is just based upon their observable world, right? You wouldn't know that's a huge sphere that just dropped on our plane, you know, you just see the dot. Or it's a small sphere. Um, you wouldn't know the difference. Why, why is this interesting? Because I think this has some really interesting implications for how we understand who God might be. So here's a question. What would happen if three fingers intersected a plane? You would get three circles, right? In your 3D world, you understand that that's all just part of one person, my hand. It's not even my whole person. It's just three fingers that are poking through the plane. You would see in 2D world three distinct circles, but they all belong to the same person. What implications might this have for our understanding of something like the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit? What implications might this have for a God being in more places than one? When we consider that maybe God lives in a dimension beyond our own, beyond fourth dimension, or where maybe fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, you know, whatever it might be, things that might seem really impossible for us, just almost like logically impossible for us, might not be impossible for God at all. They might be very simple for him to interact with our world. And I think this is where science can add insight to our theology. And some of the most brilliant thinkers in science and their conceptions of the world around us and how we understand it could actually add to the way we come to explain who God is might be. All right. Number three, the science and faith analogy. So someone, I was talking with a friend this past week, and he <laughs> was, I was telling him about, hey, I'm going to be speaking about science and faith, and he kind of likes this topic too, and he was talking about this great analogy between the difference of, uh, of science and faith. Uh, and he, one of the illustrations that he used to use when he was working with youth was like, you know, science is really like studying a bridge. You can study a bridge. You can look at the materials it's made out of. You look at the design, uh, how it's built up, uh, what kind of weight-bearing load it has, all, all these different aspects of a bridge you can study. Um, faith is getting on the bridge. It is understanding that God has invited you to get on this bridge and begin this journey with him. They are both important. It's important to know the bridge, and if this is a very brand new road for you and you've just never seen it before, God isn't shy about you looking at the bridge. <laughs> Have at it. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy the design. Enjoy the materials. Go for it. But he's also inviting you to step on and to move forward. And I use this analogy to help some of us here. Now, a number of us here at Access uh, are kind of on this journey to figure out if, if this whole God thing might be true, whether or not you want to jump in. And my question is, where are you with the bridge? Where might you be? Are you still checking it out? Are you making your first step forward? Know this. God God invites you into this new world, this new kingdom, with Jesus as the way. 
And he is not afraid of your mind or your thoughts. And he's not asking you to go in blindly. Come, know. Know that God is good. Know that his promises are true. Uh, and if you're here, maybe this metaphor might be a, a helpful way for you to talk about where you line up in the faith and, and where you hope to be and, and what needs to happen next. I hope this analogy is helpful for you. Um, one last thing. Is reclaiming our curiosity and our wonder. Reclaiming curiosity and wonder. One of the negative things that happens when we live in this either-or universe and have to choose between faith and science that some people have laid out and said this is the life you have to choose is it causes knowledge to be very closed, that you can't explore other things because it belongs to another side or some other side is. And to be fair, some of that has happened over history, which is why certain movements have developed the way they have. They've been bludgeoned to over the head with a lot of supposed science or knowledge. Um, if we are to move forward with faith and science together in a both and kind of a, a narrative, I think it opens up again this possibility for wonder and for worship. Francis Collins writes this in his book, The Language of God. The God of the Bible is also the God of the genome. He can be worshipped in the cathedral or in the laboratory. His creation is majestic. It's awesome, intricate, and beautiful. As he was staring at the human genome, he was worshiping. He was saying the God who created this was amazing. And that kind of integrated worldview is what we're after here. And I hope for some of you, as you're diving into your professional careers or the life that you've, that God is leading you on, know that this is a God-soaked world. The psalmist used to declare, hey, heaven and earth are full of God's glory. To so go and enjoy it. Have at it. So I don't know what this might look like for you. I was trying to think of some ways that this could be practical. I know this is Houston, and you might not want to be out in cold and rain. Um, this week, uh, this morning when I woke up, I, I was watching a YouTube video. So this is my, this is my suggestion to you. This week, take five minutes, explore the natural world, and let it lead you into wonder and worship the God of creation. Let it fill your heart. Maybe it's a YouTube video, a Nat Geo video. Maybe it's like, um, so I saw the mountain biking video, and I was looking at this morning, and I saw the, the first like five comments. All of them were saying, God's creation is awesome. It's like, how did you get that from a mountain biking video? But really, when you see it, 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 is tr it was truly amazing. Uh, maybe just post it on the Axis Facebook and just share it that way. Anyways, what am I getting at here? Um, I think it would be wonderful if we regained curiosity and wonder and that science could be a weaved into that whole picture that we're after. So... As we wrap up here today, this, these are a couple of conversation questions. Have you experienced the science and faith conflict in your life or seen that conflict in those around you? Have you felt like you've had to make that either or choice of choosing one or the other? Um, what strikes you when you hear Isaiah 55? That God's thoughts and his ways are far beyond our own. And where might you be on the faith bridge? So uh, conversations around here are, are open. Uh, you, you could jump in and participate. Uh, and if you don't like it, <laughs> you could always go to the bathroom or <laughs> you could just uh, say, hey, I'm new here. I'd rather not. Yeah, I just want to listen. That's totally okay here too. Uh, there's no obligation. But why don't you take the next three, four minutes and just circle up with the people around us and have at it. Choose a question, talk about it, and uh, let's see where this goes. <laughs>